This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Peterson, Massa Martana, Italy. A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 14 A Duel to the Death. My first impulse was to tell her of my love, and then I thought of the helplessness of her position, wherein I alone could lighten the burdens of her captivity, and protect her in my poor way against the thousands of hereditary enemies she must face upon our arrival at Thark. I could not chance causing her additional pain or sorrow by declaring a love which in all probability she did not return." Should I be so indiscreet, her position would be even more unbearable than now, and the thought that she might feel that I was taking advantage of her helplessness to influence her decision was the final argument which sealed my lips. "'Why are you so quiet, Deja Thoris?' I asked. "'Possibly you would rather return to Sola and your quarters?' "'No,' she murmured. "'I am happy here.' I do not know why it is I should always be happy and contented when you, John Carter, a stranger, are with me. Yet at such times it seems that I am safe, and that with you I shall soon return to my father's court and feel his strong arms about me and my mother's tears and kisses on my cheeks. "'Do people kiss, then, upon Barsoom?' I asked, when she had explained the word she used in answer to my inquiring as to its meaning. "'Parents, brothers, and sisters, yes, and,' she added in a low, thoughtful tone, "'lovers.' "'And you, Deja Thoris, have parents and brothers and sisters?' "'Yes.' "'And, uh, lover?' "'She was silent.' nor could I venture to repeat the question. "'The man of Barsoom,' she finally ventured, "'does not ask personal questions of women, "'except his mother, and the woman he has fought for and won.' "'But I have fought,' I started, "'and then I wished my tongue had been cut from my mouth, "'for she turned even as I caught myself and ceased.' and drawing my silks from her shoulder she held them out to me, and without a word, and with head held high, she moved with the carriage of the queen she was toward the plaza and the doorway of her quarters. I did not attempt to follow her, other than to see that she reached the building in safety, but directing Wula to accompany her, I turned disconsolately and entered my own house. I sat for hours cross-legged and cross-tempered upon my silks, meditating upon the queer freaks chance plays upon us poor devils of mortals. So this was love. I had escaped it for all the years I had roamed the five continents and their encircling seas, in spite of beautiful women and urging opportunity, in spite of a half-desire for love and a constant search for my ideal, it had remained for me to fall furiously and hopelessly in love with a creature from another world, of a species similar possibly, yet not identical with mine. A woman who was hatched from an egg, whose span of life might cover a thousand years, whose people had strange customs and ideas, a woman whose hopes, whose pleasures, whose standards of virtues and of right and wrong might vary as greatly from mine as did those of the green Martians. Yes, I was a fool, but I was in love, and though I was suffering the greatest misery I had ever known, I would not have had it otherwise for all the riches of Barsoom. Such is love, and such are lovers wherever love is known. To me, Deja Thoris was all that was perfect, all that was virtuous and beautiful and noble and good. I believed that from the bottom of my heart, from the depth of my soul on that night in Korad, as I sat cross-legged upon my silks, while the nearer moon of Barsoom raced through the western sky toward the horizon, and lighted up the golden marble and jeweled mosaics of my world-old chamber, and I believe it to-day as I sit at my desk in the little study overlooking the Hudson. 
Twenty years have intervened. For ten of them I lived and fought for Dejah Thoris and her people, and for ten I have lived upon her memory. The morning of our departure for Thark dawned clear and hot, as do all Martian mornings, except for the six weeks when the snows melt at the poles. I sought out Dejah Thoris and the throng of departing chariots, but she turned her shoulder to me, and I could see the red blood mount to her cheek. With the foolish inconsistency of love I held my peace, when I might have pled ignorance of the nature of my offense, or at least the gravity of it, and so have effected, at worst, a half-conciliation. My duty dictated that I must see that she was comfortable, and so I glanced into her chariot and rearranged her silks and furs. In doing so, I noted with horror that she was heavenly chained by one ankle to the side of the vehicle. "'What does this mean?' I cried, turning to Sola. "'Sarkoja thought it was best,' she answered, her face betokening her disapproval of the procedure." Examining the manacles, I saw that they fastened with a massive spring lock. "'Where is the key, Sola? Let me have it!' "'Sarkoja wears it, John Carter,' she answered. I turned without further word and sought out Tars Tarkas, to whom I vehemently objected to the unnecessary humiliations and cruelties, as they seemed to my lover's eyes, that were being heaped upon Dejah Thoris. "'John Carter,' he answered, if ever you and Deja Thoris escape the Tharks, it will be upon this journey. We know that you will not go without her. You have shown yourself a mighty fighter, and we do not wish to manacle you, so we hold you both in the easiest way that will yet ensure security. I have spoken. I saw the strength of his reasoning at a flash, and knew that it were futile to appeal from his decision, but I asked that the key be taken from Sarkoja, and that she be directed to leave the prisoner alone in the future. This much, Tars Tarkas, you may do for me in return for the friendship that I must confess I feel for you. Friendship, he replied, there is no such thing, John Carter but have your will. I shall direct that Sarkoja cease to annoy the girl, and I myself will take custody of the key. Unless you wish me to assume the responsibility, I said, smiling. He looked at me long and earnestly before he spoke. Were you to give me your word that neither you nor Deja Thoris would attempt to escape until after we have safely received the court of Talhajus, you might have the key and throw the chains into the river Is. It were better that you held the key, Tars Tarkas, I replied. He smiled and said no more, but that night as we were making camp I saw him unfasten Deja Thoris's fetters himself. With all his cruel ferocity and coldness, there was an undercurrent of something in Tars Tarkas which he seemed ever battling to subdue. Could it be a vestige of some human instinct come back from an ancient forebear to haunt him with the horror of his people's ways? As I was approaching Dejah Thoris's chariot, I passed Sarkoja, and the black, venomous look she accorded me was the sweetest balm I had felt for many hours. Lord, how she hated me! It bristled from her so palpably that one might almost have cut it with a sword. A few moments later I saw her deep in conversation with a warrior named Zad, a big, hulking, powerful brute, but one who had never made a kill among his own chieftains, and a second name only with the medal of some chieftain. It was this custom which entitled me to the names of either of the chieftains I had killed. In fact, some of the warriors addressed me as Dotar Sojat, a combination of the surnames of the two warrior chieftains whose medal I had taken, or in other words, whom I had slain in fair fight. As Sarkoja talked with Zad, he cast occasional glances in my direction, while she seemed to be urging him very strongly to some action. 
I paid little attention to it at the time, but the next day I had good reason to recall the circumstances, and at the same time gain a slight insight into the depth of Sarkoja's hatred and the lengths to which she was capable of going to wreak her horrid vengeance on me. Deja Thoris would have none of me again on this evening, and though I spoke her name, she neither replied nor conceded by so much of a flutter of an eyelid that she realized my existence. In my extremity I did what most other lovers would have done. I sought word from her through an intimate. In this instance it was Sola whom I intercepted in another part of the camp. "'What is the matter with Deja Thoris?' I blurted out at her. "'Why will she not speak to me?' Sola seemed puzzled herself, as though such strange actions on the part of two humans were quite beyond her, as indeed they were, poor child. "'She says you have angered her, and that is all she will say, except that she is the daughter of a Jed, and the granddaughter of a Jedak, and has been humiliated by a creature who could not polish the teeth of her grandmother's Sorak. I pondered over this report for some time, finally saying, "'What might a Sorak be, Sola?' A little animal about as big as my hand, which the Red Martian women keep to play with, explained Sola. Not fit to polish the teeth of her grandmother's cat? I must rank pretty low in the consideration of Deja Thoris, I thought, but I could not help laughing at the strange figure of speech, so homely and in this respect so earthly. Oh, it made me homesick, for it sounded so much like not fit to polish her shoes. And then commenced a new train of thought quite new to me. I began to wonder what my people at home were doing. I had not seen them for years. There was a family of Carters in Virginia who claimed close relationship with me. I was supposed to be a great uncle or something of the kind equally foolish. I could pass anywhere for twenty-five to thirty years of age, and to be a great uncle always seemed the height of incongruity, for my thoughts and feelings were those of a boy. There was two little kitties in the Carter family whom I had loved, and who had thought there was no one on earth like Uncle Jack. I could see them just as plainly as I stood there under the moonlit skies of Barsoom, and I longed for them as I had never longed for any mortals before. By nature a wanderer, I had never known the true meaning of the word home, but the great hall of the Carters that has always stood for all that the word did mean to me, and now my heart turned toward it from the cold and unfriendly peoples I had been thrown amongst. For did not even Deja Thoris despise me? I was a low creature, so low, in fact, I was not even fit to polish the teeth of her grandmother's cat. And then my saving sense of humor came to my rescue, and laughing I turned into my silks and furs and slept upon the moon-haunted ground, the sleep of a tired and healthy fighting man. We broke camp the next day at an early hour, and marched with only a single halt until just before dark. Two incidents broke the tediousness of the march. About noon we espied far to our right, which was evidently an incubator, and Lorcas Tomal directed Tars Tarkas to investigate it. The latter took a dozen warriors, including myself, and we raced across the velvety carpeting of moss to the little enclosure. It was indeed an incubator, but the eggs were very small in comparison with those I had seen hatching in ours at the time of my arrival on Mars. Tars Tarkas dismounted and examined the enclosure minutely, finally announcing that it belonged to the green men of Warhoon, and that the cement was scarcely dry where it had been walled up. "'They cannot be a day's march ahead of us,' he exclaimed, the light of battle leaping to his fierce face. The work at the incubator was short indeed. The warriors tore open the entrance, and a couple of them, crawling in, soon demolished all the eggs with their short swords. Then, remounting, we dashed back to the join the cavalry. During the ride I took occasion to ask Tars Tarkas if these war hoons, whose eggs we had destroyed, were a smaller people than his Tharks. I noticed that their eggs were so much smaller than those I saw hatching in your incubator, I added. 
He explained that the eggs had just been placed there, but, like all green Martian eggs, they would grow during the five-year period of incubation until they obtained the size of those I had seen hatching on the day of my arrival on Barsoom. This was indeed an interesting piece of information, for it had always seemed remarkable to me that the green Martian women, large as they were, could bring forth such enormous eggs as I had seen the four-foot infants emerging from. As a matter of fact, the new-laid egg is but little larger than an ordinary goose egg, and it does not commence to grow until subjected to the light of the sun, the chieftains have little difficulty in transporting several hundred of them at once from the storage vaults to the incubators. Shortly after the incident of the Warhoon eggs, we halted to rest the animals, and it was during this halt that the second of the day's interesting episodes occurred. I was engaged in changing my riding clothes from one of my thoughts to the other, for I divided the day's work between them, when Zad approached me, and without a word struck my animal a terrific blow with his long sword. I did not need a manual of green Martian etiquette to know what reply to make, for, in fact, I was so wild with anger that I could scarcely refrain from drawing my pistol and shooting him down for the brute he was. But he stood waiting with drawn longsword, and my only choice was to draw my own and meet him in fair fight with his choice of weapons or a lesser one. This latter alternative is always permissible, therefore I could have used my short sword, my dagger, my hatchet, or my fists had I wished, and been entirely within my rights, but I could not use firearms or a spear while he held only his long sword. I chose the same weapon he had drawn, because I knew he prided himself upon his ability with it, and I wished, if I worsted him at all, to do it with his own weapon. The fight that followed was a long one, and delayed the resumption of the march for an hour. The entire community surrounded us, leaving a clear space about one hundred feet in diameter for our battle. Zad first attempted to rush me down as a bull might a wolf, but I was much too quick for him, and each time I sidestepped his rushes he would go lunging past me, only to receive a nick from my sword upon his arm or back. He was soon streaming blood from a half-dozen minor wounds, but I could not obtain an opening to deliver an effective thrust. Then he changed his tactics, and fighting warily and with extreme dexterity, he tried to do by science what he was unable to do by brute strength. I must admit that he was a magnificent swordsman, and it not been for my greater endurance and the remarkable agility the lesser gravitation of Mars lent me, I might not have been able to put up the creditable fight I did against him. We circled for some time without doing much damage on either side, the long, straight, needle-like swords flashing in the sunlight and ringing out upon the stillness as they crashed together with each effective parry. Finally, Zad, realizing that he was tiring more than I, evidently decided to close in and end the battle in a final blaze of glory for himself. Just as he rushed me, a blinding flash of light struck full in my eyes, so that I could not see his approach, and could only leap blindly to one side in an effort to escape the mighty blade that it seemed I could already feel in my vitals. I was only partially successful, as a sharp pain in my left shoulder attested but in the sweep of my glance, as I sought to again locate my adversary, a sight met my astonished gaze which paid me well for the wound the temporary blindness had caused me. There, upon Dejah Thoris's chariot, stood three figures, for the purpose evidently of witnessing the encounter above the heads of the intervening Tharks. There were Dejah Thoris, Sola, and Sarkoja, and as my fleeting glance swept over them, a little tableau was presented which will stand graven in my memory to the day of my death. As I looked, Dejah Thoris turned upon Sarkoja with the fury of a young tigress, and struck something from her upraised hand, something which flashed in the sunlight as it spun to the ground. 
then i knew what had blinded me at that crucial moment of the fight and how sarkoja had found a way to kill me without herself delivering the final thrust another thing i saw too which almost lost my life for me then and there for it took my mind for the fraction of an instant entirely from my antagonist for as deja thoris struck the tiny mirror from her hand sarkoja her face livid with hatred and baffled rage whipped out her dagger and aimed a terrific blow at deja thoris and then sola our dear and faithful sola sprang between them the last i saw was the great knife descending upon her shielding breast my enemy had recovered from his thrust and was making it extremely interesting for me so i reluctantly gave my attention to the work in hand but my mind was not upon the battle we rushed each other furiously time after time till suddenly feeling the sharp point of his sword at my breast and a thrust i could neither parry nor escape i threw myself upon him with outstretched sword and with all the weight of my body determined that i would not die alone if i could prevent it i felt the steel tear into my chest all went black before me my head whirled in dizziness and i felt my knees giving beneath me End of chapter fourteen